know this is supposed to be a session where scientists speak, but I realize that scientists are speaking not to scientists, but speaking to a general public. So I'm going to speak to a general public. Okay. I think this conference, it seems to me, is a dreamers conference, is about what awaits us on this planet, our future, also our present. And what awaits us is our future, is a question is, can it be predicted? And I say to you, it cannot be predicted. It doesn't matter, because the future has been said many times, is not to be predicted, but to be created. And if we can create the future, <clears throat> then we have a living in tremendously important and interesting times. Because if we don't create the future, then it's going to be negative. All the tendencies today, we don't need to go through all that. We all know that. It's, they're all moving toward a collapse that could lead to species extinction, including the human species, but possibly all higher species. So we need to create. We need to create something different from what there is. And the question is, what do we need to create it, to create a positive future? I think again, here you can quote, make another quote. Comes this time from Einstein, who said, you can't solve a problem with the same kind of thinking that created that problem. So what we need in a nutshell is a thinking that's different from the one that has been shaping the world today. Okay. You can call this a new paradigm, I like to call that. And uh, I believe that paradigms not, do not only apply to science, they apply to all spheres of life, everything we do. A paradigm is just the basic concept of what we believe we are, our environment is, society is, the world is, and our concept of what the dominant layer, not humanity as a whole, but the dominant layer of society has thought that we are, and the world is, is the old paradigm. It's a mistaken paradigm. Actually, it's an aberration in the history of culture by humanity on this earth, because for thousands of years, we knew that we were part of nature. We knew that we are part of each other. We knew that we are intimately connected and that our future lies together. Our present is also lies together, just as our past has been. But for reasons that we can, don't need to go into now, but has to do a lot with the mentality of the modern age, uh, some uh, equations coming from Isaac Newton, who did not intend them to describe reality or the world, intending them to explain certain phenomena of interaction, those had been picked up and made into the master equations of the universe. That's the mechanistic worldview based on the classical Newtonian science. According to this th way of thinking, every bit of item that exists, whether it's a single particle, an atom, a molecule, a cell, an organism, a species, a population, an ecosystem, or a galaxy is separate from all the, all the others. We are all moving according to our own laws, the laws which are universal laws, of course, but they are laws of interaction between distinct and separate entities. They are not co-evolving laws. This is an artificial innovation, or, or actually aberration, in the history of life, in the history of culture. Because if you look at all the great religious systems, they always told you that we are all part, part of nature, part of the world around us, and that we need to behave. They did behave accordingly. And this is why human culture with a lot of problems and non-linearity struggles and die-outs in between, but on the whole managed to sustain itself, to, 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 to survive for all these thousands of years. 
how many thousands, we don't know, at least 50,000 years since we have be become aware that we are a cultural species, that we are mortal, uh, that we have our own life, that we can perceive our environment and speculate what the world is around us. But certainly in the last 200, 250 years, another kind of idea surfaced, which is that we are all radically separate, categorically separate bits of matter, of which the rest is just provides the background for taking care of itself. And it's not really, in, in, not really involved with, responsible for the rest. Every particle in this universe is out for itself. And we are all basically atomic, supraatomic, supramolecular, supracellular particles. Just taking care of ourselves, our, our survival for as long as we live. And after that, it's not our concern. And while we live, it's not our concern, except to do what we want to do so in order to survive to the maximum of our physical life ability. Now, with that kind of uh, ethos, a competition is open. Everybody is out for himself and herself, not only individuals, but nations, but companies, but ethnic groups. And we are just trying to maintain ourselves as long as we can. Now, this situation brought us to the position that we have now where competition, instead of providing the equitable solution of Adam Smith's invisible hand, provides an accumulation and concentration of wealth, power, and privilege, where increasing numbers of people are marginalized, are pressed at the very edge of survival, as we now see in the world all around us, and where the, amount, the, the upper 2% of the population as 80% of the wealth held by hum humans on this planet, and where uh, there is nothing like equality, nothing like distribution of, of, of resources or privileges. And this results not only in an abstract notion of inequality, but it results in the disbalancing of the equilibria which, on which life depends. It results in a system that is totally, we would say, in system theory, sub-optimized. It optimizes the privileged few and neglects the, the underprivileged majority, which becomes ever greater and greater majority. Where does this lead to? It leads to the edge of the sustainability of the system. Not by mistake that we are starting to talk about sustainability. Since the Brundtland report talked about it in the 1980s in the UN, uh, coming from Norway originally, uh, at least Mr. Brundtland came from there. Uh, uh, but then it was just an idea that we should use resources in such a way that future generations could have resources for themselves. It did not appear to be a question of our own survival. And now, lately, it's the issue has come appearing very much that what sustainability means can we sustain ourselves alive, viable on this earth in a way that we don't destroy things around us and don't destroy ultimately ourselves. What do we need to have such a sustainability? Then let's just go as this is supposed to be by scientists, so I just throw in a couple of concepts that come from science but make a lot of sense in, in everyday concepts. We need to be coherent. The entire system, every part of it, needs to be coherent with every other part. And why is that? And what do you mean by coherence? It means, in this context, it means that every part is connected with every other part sensitively connected in such a way that it perceives some elements of the behavior of other parts and responds in some way. A perfectly connected system is coherent in such that every part of it responds to every other part. 
a healthy organism is coherent. Because if any cell, I can't talk about individual cells, but any group of cells is not responding to the rest of the organism, the organism is diseased. That's disease, a breakdown of coherence in the organism. If a group of cells manages to multiply itself without regard to its effect on the rest of the organism, then we know it as cancer, because it kills the rest of the organism sooner or later. So an organism, in order to be sustainable, has to be coherent. And there are two kinds of coherence to be taken care of on the other one. How does the other particle know? You know? Alain Aspect, the French physicist in the 1970s, when he first tested this and came up with the results, found that this effect is real. It's not transmitted by some kind of vehicle or instrument or, or some kind of medium. It's true, it's a non-local remote effect. He was so depressed after he published his paper. He refused to talk about it anymore or publish anymore because it contradicts the law, which is even in the relativity theory, that you do not have interactions above the speed of light. And this instant interaction, independently of space and it seems of time, is the non-locality interaction, which means that the quantum effects that affect quantum systems on the microscopic level affect systems also on another dimension, on a macroscopic dimension. So that it becomes fashionable and without exaggeration I think one can claim that the quantum systems which are entangled, which is another word being used for this non-locality, with, with one another, this entanglement holds true on macroscopic levels. So that we could say that we, as a living organism, where these effects particularly come through, we are macros macroscopic quantum systems. We are entangled, not in every respect, obviously, but there's more and more evidence that some of these effects, non-local effects, operate in our body. I was very intrigued by Professor Pollack's mentioning the heart example. I have a group of physicists working on the same problem in Hungary. And they found it was literally impossible that the heart should manage to pump all that blood into all, in all the capillaries. You know, it, it just simply doesn't work. So how does it work? They are going after hypothesis. Which, uh, which are like quantum effects, whereby there's an in-phase coloration all, all around, all across the, the circuit of blood flow, in which there is an, an in-phase push of the blood flow and all points, whereby the heart gives the rhythm, gives the order, as it were, but the actual blood is flowing because there's an in-phase quantum effect all through the, the, the capillaries. You know. Seems a bit far-fetched. They are working now on the physics of this, but interesting enough, they are not even medical scientists; they are physicists working on this. You know? And I, I think probably in about a month or two we'll have the first report on, on, on the on this. Just to show you, we now know that the photosynthetic effect relies on quantum effects. Uh, the energy that is sun solar energy is transduced into the living cell and into the organism through quantum. Uh, for furthering, and by Engels and his, and his collaborators from the 30, 10 years ago or more. And we know more and more of these effects, which say, we say to you with a slight exaggeration, but a little generalization, is that we are macroscopic quantum systems. I'd just like to leave some of this concept with you. We are semi-incoherent macroscopic quantum systems. What we would need to become is super coherent macroscopic quantum systems. Okay. This is a possibility that we would become that because every living system that so far did not become extinct but survives is a super coherent macroscopic quantum system. Couldn't, couldn't exist otherwise. And this big step 
or becoming super coherent, which means externally coherent, being becoming a coherent part of a coherent planetary system. You can put it in these general terms also. To do that, we would have to readjust our frequencies. We would have to become in line, in frequency, with, uh, in phase, rather, in phase with the other systems around us. And if we do that, fortunately, we don't need to go and sit down and calculate all the phases and the effects, but we need to allow the natural processes that are in our bodies, in our organism, that have enabled us to come to, into existence, that same information, which the Orientals call the chi or the ki, which emerges as a survival instinct, as a social instinct, as, as the altruistic instinct, as the collective instinct, whatever all those things, emerges these days ever more under the notion of love, as exp an expression of the same thing, which means that systems can only survive if they're coherent with the other systems around them. So all these various uh, attempts to become sustainable have to be measured against this ultimate criteria. There are so many models. I'm very interested in the business models because I think that if there's going to be positive change, it's going to come from two levels. First, in civic society, civil society, basically, on the level where people are undergoing this process, which they call waking up wanting to become, as they call it, one in the world around them. And that this kind of a process must be supported and promoted by the enterprise sector. Because it's not the enterprise sector can be truly global, can operate, is already operating as global. Whereas the nation state sector, the political sector is very much linked to its, na to its national constituency, the way it is operating, way it's been set up. So it's always me against you on the political way. And on an, inter on an enterprise level, begin to realize that it's our enterprise together with its living environment, if it's at all, is going to be successful and flourishing. Yeah. And in the civic sector, we realize that if we don't love others like we love ourselves, we are not going to come to a good end ourselves. So all these things are surfacing. And this surfacing, as we heard in the past two days here, is being aided by sources beyond our ken. I would just say to you, I believe so, because uh, I, my own work, I think, has been benefited from this. The ideas that I, I come forth so very often are being suggested, guided to it. I don't claim to have come up with it fully. But that I, as, at the same time, I want to warn you not to put your full confidence in that, full trust, to the extent where you become complacent. Complacency is just as ignorance is the greatest sin. Because we need to push, pull our weight in order to bring this system into a balance where it can co-evolve continually. And this non-linearity, which is the macro shift, which is the, which is the bifurcation, can be found again on a new level. The task is, in these terms, is in the thermodynamic term, is to find the equilibrium, find the balance between free energy used up energy, and the work that's performed as you extract the free energy from the flow between sun, earth, and surrounding space. So extract it in such a way that it becomes available for the network of life around you. Okay? That is the challenge before us. And I think because we, ha we are non-local quantum beings, we have a chance. Because what we do affects others much, much beyond our perceptions, our immediate perceptions. If it was only dependent, if we were truly separate, we'd be doomed. Because then what we do, if you don't become 
angels, altruistic angels who start working just for everybody else, you know, then it wouldn't work. But even if we don't start working for everybody else, if we start working in a healthy way, we are becoming compatible with others around us because we are non-locally interconnected. We are capable of evolving together. And that's the only way we can evolve. The Buddhists have known this for thousands of years, you know, dependent co-evolution, as they call it. I think the great systems of religion, spirituality, have known you don't go out by yourself alone. You do it together with everything, with all of creation around you. Now, fortunately, we are also entangled non-local quantum beings. Again, don't overplace your confidence in that, but you can be sure that if you truly become super coherent yourself, it's going to affect your environment. So be selfish in an enlightened way. Know that for you to survive, you must make sure that the entire system around you works. You know. And if you really work, af go after this, that you want to work in this compatible way, survive in this compatible way, then your EPR, non-local effect, will penetrate elsewhere. You know. So Gandhi was not just an utopian when he said, be the change you want to see in the world. We could say, be the change, because you, your change is going to affect the rest of the world. My advice and my conclusion is, try to act like a super coherent quantum system. It seems like a scientific jargon, but if you just build it down, break it down, what it means, try to act like an integral conscious part of this entire system. Of the